Welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in to hear my trading and market updates. This is Uncle Frank and I'm not a financial advisor, nor is any of the content to be construed as financial advice. This channel is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to hit the like button if you enjoyed the presentation and be sure to subscribe to the channel so you're alerted when I have new information to share. So now let's get into the latest updates. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're going to kick this off with a quick look back on last week's action and then a look forward to plan for the coming week with this review from Wall Street Breakfast. After posting its worst weekly performance in over a year last Friday, the S&P 500 rebounded this week to score its best performance since October of 2023. The rise was primarily driven by a surge in tech stocks and other growth sectors anchored by favorably received quarterly reports from Tesla, Microsoft, and Alphabet. However, aside from earnings, market participants received a bit of a reality check in the form of economic data on GDP and core PCE that pointed to stalling growth and sticky inflation. All eyes are now on the Fed Reserve's latest meeting on Tuesday and Wednesday. U.S. GDP growth cooled in quarter one to its slowest pace in two years, but PCE inflation in the quarter came in hotter, unnerving investors and raising stagflation fears. However, the stock market react more positively on Friday when the core PCE price index, that's the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, rose 0.3% month over month in March, matching expectations. Now, if you've never lived through a period of stagflation, it sucks. It's defined as an economic cycle characterized by slow growth, a high unemployment rate and high inflation. Now it last occurred in the 70s when conditions were far worse than today. Uh, in 75, for example, inflation topped 10% while the unemployment rate peaked at 9%, right? But this is the concern, is that growth is slowing, right? Unemployment could rise and inflation is more stubborn than they predicted. Next, we have to cover big tech because the MAG-7 has been driving this market for months. Three big tech players reported earnings this week with artificial intelligence taking the spotlight. Meta slumped 15.1% after hours on Wednesday, despite its Q1 earnings beat as its guidance disappointed, remember that, and investors were irked by a heavy AI spending forecast. Now, Google and Microsoft convinced investors that their huge AI bets are already paying off. Alphabet surged by double digits after hours on Thursday after its Q1 results easily cleared estimates driven by search strength. The tech giant also rewarded investors with its first ever dividend. Microsoft rose 4.4% after hours on Thursday as AI adoption across its cloud services boosted its Q3 results. What I want you to take away from this slide that applies to us is Meta. They hit their numbers, but forward guidance was weak, so the stock sold off, right? Okay, so Meta hit its numbers, but forward guidance was weak, so the stock tanked. Tesla, on the other hand, seemed to miss on everything last week, but had strong forward guidance, so the stock advanced. Tesla shot up 13% to 163.96 per share after hours on Tuesday, despite a sharp drop in Q1 earnings deliveries and margins as investors latched on to the automakers commitment to launch more affordable models that can be produced on the existing production lines. Now, this shows you how important forward guidance and a strong CEO really is. A CEO that cares about shareholder value and is willing to fight the street for it. Elon Musk knew he missed far before the market did so he was sure to show up to his earnings call with something in hand to counter. Now compare that to Adam Aaron and our last four, uh, fourth quarter. We all expected it to be a tough quarter because of the strikes, but what did Adam bring to the table? Nothing. When AMC went to CinemaCon, we were the only ones there not promoting a special project. 
All Adam had to offer is that bankruptcy was improbable. That's it. Remember, after the success of Taylor Swift and Beyonce, he said the phone was ringing off the hook for more concert films, right? You'd think the guy would show up to the fourth quarter earnings call or CinemaCon with something in hand to promote, right? Like, hey, we've got a deal with Dua Lipa or 50 Cents or we're in talks with this artist about bringing their concert film to AMC, but nothing. Adam wants the company to survive so he and senior management can continue to milk it, but he and Wall Street want the stock down and under control. This has been Adam's MO since the very first rally he killed when the stock was mooning. Shit, Tesla is laying off nearly 700 employees at its Nevada plant and the stock still held its rally. Don't believe me? Think I'm being unfair? Picking on this fat degenerate CEO that has killed more rallies than I care to remember? Let's compare headlines. Tesla soars 13.1% after hours on affordable EV promise, on just a promise. All right, now let's look at ours. Adam Aaron brushes off box office woes. It's inconceivable that AMC would file for Chapter 11. Well, thanks. AMC CEO predicts movie theaters will be roaring in 2025. Okay, so next year. AMC Entertainment paid CEO Aaron $25.4 million in 2023, a gain of 7.2% right? There's nothing exciting to say about retail popcorn or a new concert film. Just, you know, next year looks great. I wish you Adam Aaron fanboys would invest the same amount of effort in getting rid of this distress credit private equity CEO in replacing him with a real CEO. Maybe we would see some headlines like this for a change. Boeing shares leap as it unveils CEO exit, major leadership changes. Or how about this one? BP investors send shares soaring as new CEO woos them with buyback boost. Boku Incorporated soars high with 26% revenue boost amid CEO's exit. And from Barron's, Gap stock soars as new CEO makes strong start. Keep making excuses for him to cover up the fact that he robbed you. We're down 99% off of our all-time highs. We pay this clown four times what the CEO of Cinemark is paid. Keep making excuses for him. Maybe if he shoves another reverse split down your throat, you'll finally agree we need a change of leadership at AMC if we're ever going to effectively address our debt issues going forward. And from the Wall Street Journal, AMC is expecting revenue in the first quarter to be roughly flat compared with a year ago, despite a weaker slate of film releases denting box office returns. The movie theater chain said on Friday that based on preliminary results, it expects first quarter revenue of $951.4 million down from $954.4 million in the prior year. Analysts polled by FactSet are expecting $861.1 million in revenue for the period. Well, naturally they are. They've been, you know, wrong, what, 12 times in a row? The company is expecting a loss of $163.5 million, or $0.62 cents a share, in the quarter ending March 31st, compared with a loss of $235.5 million, or $1.71 a share, a year earlier. I say that's a fantastic improvement, but no one gives a shit about our progress, only Cinemarks. That's why Adam released this Friday after the bell, because this improvement could have been interpreted as good news. When we had the best third quarter of our entire history, Adam waited until before the open the next day to destroy any chance of a rally back then. By the way, analysts polled by FactSet expect a per, sh uh, per share loss of 77 cents. Whatever, guys. You know me. Without a swan, Wall Street and Adam Aaron have us exactly where they want us. The preferred share we gave away for free, the ape, the pounce, it transferred all the power from the shareholders to AMC senior management. They will do absolutely nothing to hurt the interests of Wall Street, and they've proven that time and time again. Just take a look at your stock price compared to Cinemark's. 
the ape, its conversion and reverse split we never needed to do basically was a reset button for our enemies. That's why we went from very little stock available to lend and short at cost to borrow fees exceeding a thousand percent to having millions of shares available to lend and short under 3%. That's what Wall Street desperately needed. Short sellers planned that in our boardroom with Adam, and that's exactly what they got. Regulators will do absolutely nothing to significantly hurt Wall Street, especially during an election year. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not. So my hunt for a swan event that radically affects our enemies goes on. So when Elon Musk is facing bad quarterly results, he comes up with the promise of lower price cars and the stock jumps double digits. That's not what our guy does. When Trump's company is attacked by short sellers, the CEO demands an investigation, but not our guy. Citadel Securities blasts Trump media CEO Devin Nunes over short selling letter. But our guy has a whole different tone. All the stuff you read about market manipulation and fails to deliver billions of synthetic shares out there, that's not our problem. You see, guys, most CEOs would say no comment on FTDs and synthetic shares, but our guy goes out of his way to say they don't exist. Candidly, I've seen no evidence so-called fake or synthetic shares exist, but many of you disagree. This preferred equity dividend goes only to company issued shares, so it will have the impact of a share count or unique dividend many of you have sought. Hashtag today we pounce. Yeah, that all worked out really well for us, didn't it, guys? In 2023, securities lenders made more money lending out AMC than any other security in the world. In my opinion, that's statistically impossible without the existence of synthetic shares. But has Adam or our CFO ever even mentioned that? Of course not. Do you think Trump's lawyers would have? Of course they would. But that's how Adam got you to go along with giving Ape away for free as a dividend instead of selling it in a normal preferred share offering. It's all in the minutes and the Allegheny emails. You just have to read them for yourself. He knew we desperately wanted a share count to expose the synthetics and the real short positions. So he added that to his sales pitch and it worked. Now guys, this is what a typical preferred share offering looks like. This one is from Prospect Capital. Let's read the overview. Founded in 2004, Prospect Capital is a $7.9 billion company. By the way, did you know AMC's market cap once exceeded $27 billion? Anyway, they're a leading provider of private debt and private equity to middle market companies in the United States. The offering is titled Prospect Capital Convertible Preferred Stock Offering. Just like the Ape, right? It's convertible into common and it's a preferred share. Offering price? $25 per share. Offering size, $1.8 billion. So Uncle Frank, are you saying we could have sold Ape like this instead of giving it away for free or at a penny as a dividend and raise billions? Yes, I am. And I think the apes and institutions would have gobbled it up. It wouldn't have looked exactly like this one. So all the critics out there relax. But this was an alternative and Adam went the other way the way Wall Street shorts needed him to. And short sellers of AMC, like Citigroup, our chief investment banker, planned it for him in our own boardroom, and Adam Aaron and Philip Later of Morgan Stanley signed off on it. Just read the emails and the board minutes from the Allegheny case for yourself. Wall Street needed real AMC shares, and we weren't selling any, and they needed them cheap. So by converting Ape to Common, those shares went from being like securities to real locates. Now, guys, we have a lot of technical and fundamental experts in our community, but this is investment banking. That's why Boss Blunts and Little Bigums and Phil For Real and several others are always confused and frustrated by the fact that every time Adam does anything, the stock gets pounded even lower. 
If you didn't know, we could have sold Ape instead of giving it away for free as a dividend. You can't see Adam for what he really is, a distress credit private equity executive. He is with them, not us. Do you get it now, or are you waiting for the next reverse split like they did to Mullen before you believe it? Do you know how he got everyone to go for it? Because they thought it would act like a share count. And if that didn't work, the QCIP change on the conversion would catch them. That's right. He manipulated us with tweets, clever hashtags, and free NFTs. Not only did he screw us with Ape, the preferred share, he named it after us the final insult to injury. All right, let's get to the fun stuff. Republic First Bank officially collapses, seized by regulators. U.S. regulators have seized Republic First Bank Corp. and agreed to sell it to Fulton Bank, the FDIC said on Friday, underscoring the challenges facing regional banks a year after the collapse of three peers. The Philadelphia-based bank, which had abandoned funding talks with a group of investors, was seized by the Pennsylvania Department of Banking and Securities. The FDIC, appointed as a receiver, said Fulton Bank, a unit of Fulton Financial Corp., will assume substantially all deposits and purchase all the assets of Republic Bank to protect depositors. Pretty slick putting this out after the bell on Friday evening, wasn't it? Did you think we really wouldn't notice? And more from Swan Watch. Last 24 hours, BRICS. China expects major economic growth after ditching U.S. dollar. And then from the Daily Hodel. China dumps $74 billion in U.S. Treasuries in one year as two BRIC nations say they've abandoned the dollar in mutual trade. Now, we heard this from the Treasury Department and the crypto guys, but not seeing this on CNBC or Yahoo Finance. And from yesterday, commercial real estate loan risk getting worse by the day. This is like a slow motion train wreck. We continue to see more troubling news about commercial real estate loans. We have been warning about this ticking time bomb on bank balance sheets for two years now. Well, apes have been warning about unrealized losses and securities sold yet not purchased for three years now. You have to engage in due diligence regarding the banks that house your hard-earned money to make sure you are not caught during a banking crisis. If you listen closely, guys, Wall Street, especially the prime brokers, will tell you exactly what they want. Not always the truth, not what's best for the markets or retail, but what's best for them and their biggest clients, the hedgies. Bank of America lays out the exact scenario that could finally pop the stock market's AI bubble. Now, B of A, that's Kenny's prime broker. That's one of his biggest lenders. You have to pay attention. Bank of America says the ongoing anything but bonds bull market has led to a very top-heavy stock market. The firm is watching real 10-year yields and credit spreads for signals of when that AI-led rally could end. B of A says higher yields and tighter spreads could sound recession alarms and spur a stock sell-off. Bank of America has coined a phrase for what's going on in markets right now, calling it an anything but bonds bull run. Can you hear what they want, guys? Their clients are short big tech. They want it down and they want the broader market down with it. They may even be accumulating bonds as yields are up and bond prices are down, anticipating this AI bubble. Okay, guys, now let's review what economic releases and events are coming up so we can mark up the calendar. Here's the big one. Fed Reserve holds rates steady. Uncle Sam unveils stimulus plans. Amid diminishing prospects of a Fed Reserve interest rate reduction, President Biden's Treasury Department is gearing up to inject liquidity into both the financial markets and the broader economy, strategically timed ahead of the November elections. Following the substantial influx of tax payments on April 15th, 
Janet Yellen's Treasury is poised to deploy a portion of these funds into the financial system. Estimates by Wall Street strategists suggest that this injection could amount to as much as $200 billion, a move intended to bolster market liquidity and stimulate economic activity. The specifics of the government's borrowing and disbursement plans are slated to be unveiled on May 1st, just hours before the FOMC announces its policy decisions. Given the prevailing expectations of no immediate action on interest rates by the central bank, the Treasury's forthcoming announcement is anticipated to wield significant influence over market dynamics. Now, Monday, so far, nothing important is scheduled. On Tuesday, we will see the Case-Shiller Home Price Index for 20 cities. That's 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Chicago Business Barometer, PMI, 9.45 a.m. Eastern. But at 10 a.m., Consumer Confidence. So this week, it's all about Wednesday, May 1st, beginning 8.15 a.m. Eastern Time, ADP Employment, 10 a.m., construction spending, ISM manufacturing and job openings, but 2 p.m., the FOMC interest rate decision, and at 2.30, Chair Powell will give his press conference. So we're not expecting rate movement, obviously, from the Fed. It'd be a real shock if they went up. Now, after that big Wednesday, we're going to have a pretty quiet Thursday, initial jobless claims, U.S. trade deficit and productivity all at 8.30 a.m. But Friday, U.S. employment report and unemployment rate are published at 8.30 a.m. That'll be a big number to watch. Okay, so here's the calendar. Nothing so far on the cicada apocalypse. I'll keep you up to date on that. Wednesday, May 1st. U.S. government to drop a liquidity bomb into the markets and the economy in an effort to reelect Joe Biden. And then, of course, we get the rate decision from the Fed and all Chair Powell's comments. Friday, May 3rd, will be all about employment figures. Then the following week, Wednesday, May 8th, AMC will report its full results for the first quarter, ending March 31st, 2024, after the market closes. That's also the early showing for the new Planet of the Apes movie that drops on Friday the 10th. Now, I was going to put this on the calendar for Tuesday, April 30th, mainly because so many apes were excited about this DTCC announcement on Twitter. I'll let you be the judge on how excited we should be. The DTCC, a financial services company that provides clearing and settlement services for the financial markets, stated that it will not allocate any collateral to exchange-traded funds with exposure to Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies and will not extend loans against them. The company's announcement states that effective April 30th, the DTCC will implement changes to collateral values for specific securities during its annual line of credit facility renewal, potentially affecting position values in the collateral monitor. This notice, released on April 26th, means that ETFs and similar investment instruments with Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies as underlying assets will not be assigned any collateral value resulting in a 100% reduction in their collateral value. However, in a Twitter post, cryptocurrency enthusiast K.O. Crypto Waluti clarified that this would only apply to inter-entity settlement within the line of credit system. According to Crypto Waluti, using cryptocurrency ETFs for lending and as collateral in brokerage activities will continue without impact depending on individual brokers' risk tolerance. I don't know, guys. Of course, I hope that this causes a crisis for our enemies who are desperately in need of liquidity. Um, I have a feeling it only applies to, like, us. You know, it just, there's always seems to be a way out for the bad actors, no matter how much the regulators and companies like the DTCC crack down on them. Two hours ago, I got this from 24-7 Wall Street. 
Ken Griffin's hedge fund continues its win streak with these three stocks, Home Depot, Comcast, and Uber. We don't care, but check out this from the article. Citadel is infamous in retail investor circles for its role in the GameStop short squeeze of 2021. That's when it swooped in to rescue hedge fund Melvin Capital with a $2 billion cash injection after the firm got walloped from a massive short bet on GME shares. Sony Pictures made a movie about the movement dubbed Dumb Money, reportedly upsetting Griffin for the way his firm was portrayed. These days, Citadel is navigating some fierce market headwinds, but its multi-manager strategy in which it spreads capital across niche investment groups for consistent returns hasn't failed the firm yet. It's true that with returns of 24% in 2023, the, it, the S&P outperformed the average hedge fund. But in addition to returns that are uncorrelated to the broader markets, the name of the game for hedge funds is slow and steady wins the race. Of course, getting tipped off on which stocks might be tanking could also move the meter. Earlier this year, Citadel found itself in the middle of a scandal after Bloomberg reported that Morgan Stanley had leaked its block trading scorecard with select traders, including one who worked for Griffin's firm. One of the stocks in question was iHeartMedia, but Citadel avoided the controversial short, which blew up in Morgan Stanley's face anyway. I want you guys to know that Morgan Stanley's institutional trading department was tipping off Citadel to big trades coming out, right? And our board of directors is run by an executive who still works for Morgan Stanley. Don't tell me AMC Entertainment doesn't need a management shakeup. It's time for these people to go. And on the geopolitical front from five hours ago, NATO aircraft activated after waves of Russian strikes. Aircraft from Poland's Air Force and other NATO allies have been scrambled following Russian attacks on Ukraine. The announcement came as Russia conducted a mass missile strike on energy facilities in three Ukrainian regions. So who's responsible for this recent escalation? Well, mostly us. Russian forces scramble for Ukraine territory before U.S. weapons arrive, right? So I'm glad we're $34 trillion in debt, printing more money and sending it to Ukraine to fight a war they can't possibly win just so they will keep the secrets of our politicians. Yeah, I said it. Hey, I want to thank you for watching and please remember to hit the like button after this slide if you enjoyed the presentation. Subscribe to the channel and set the alert so you're notified when I have new information to share. See you at the bell.